Good morning, beautiful, creative people. Welcome to Spire Digital. <clears throat> I am Nick Coppolo. I can confirm that is true. Uh, I'm the chief product officer here, which really means I have the honor of watching this phenomenal team of designers and uh, developers do fantastic work every day solving phenomenal problems. And it is a pleasure to be led by them. I was born into a musical family. My paternal grandfather, whose name I was given, Nick, that's me, was a saxophone player. And in the latter half of World War II, he toured with the Egg in Your Beer Band. The Egg in Your Beer Band was comprised entirely of wounded soldiers. And my grandfather was wounded in Italy. Ironically, just 40 miles and one generation removed from our ancestral village outside of Naples. When he was in convalescence, he was given the opportunity to audition and he won a seat. He then spent the rest of the war touring, doing USO shows, hospitals, sometimes back to the States for war bonds. And the mythology in my family is that music saved his life. His wound was such that he likely would have been sent back, but through music and through him and through my father, we all came to be. A generation later, my family, we were a singing family. My mother sang and performed, both my big sisters sang and performed, and my father, although he didn't perform, certainly after two, three, oh, seven glasses of wine, <laughs> was known to sing his favorite Neapolitan songs to his favorite Pavarotti album. And I sang. I sang mostly in school, although I did some of my best singing when I was 14 as the lead singer of a Led Zeppelin cover band. <laughs> That's right. There are very expensive and hard to acquire bootlegs out there. <clears throat> and I just think you have to be 14 to sing Led Zeppelin. You're right there in the cusp or the throes of puberty. Now deviant enough to appreciate the sexual double entendre of the lemon song, while still retaining the short squat vocal folds of youth, the kind of vocal folds you need to sing like Robert Plant. Well, whether I was singing Stairway to Heaven or sacred music or something in school. Never, ever, 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 ever did I think I'd be a professional singer. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not for me. My life was to be one of adventure, freedom, exploration. If you'd asked me at the time what I was going to do for a living, it was to speak in a mic with a lot of static. <laughs> if you'd asked me what I was going to do for a living at the time, the list would include things like crab boat captain in the Bering Sea, or Himalayan mountain guide, or a hermit living a sustenance life in the Yukon. Singing was not on the radar. But surveying my options as I headed into my senior year of high school, the landscape looked bleak. By that time, I had thoroughly convinced myself that I was smarter than every teacher in the history of teaching. <laughs> and that doing homework, nay, Going to class was for lemmings, idiots, <laughs> chumps, trying to placate the man of which I was not going to do. My truancy was such that my high school counselor had to count the actual hours it could be confirmed I was in class so as to make a case for my graduation. Armed with that truancy, my stellar, wait for it, 1.8 GPA, <laughs> and my phenomenal attitude, needless to say, my future looked limited. That same year, my senior year in high school, my voice teacher Joanne Clo asked me to compete in the National Association of Teachers of Singing, NATS competition. And, and NATS is not so significant, certainly not as a, a professional singer, <clears throat> but it is significant in that, at least in the 90s, it was where every major conservatory and music school went to recruit new talent. So I competed and I won. And upon winning, I was immediately surrounded by the best schools and conservatories in the country. And scholarship offers were made. And tours were scheduled. And GPAs were forgotten. <laughs> and letters of commitment signed and sent. And then, suddenly, standing before me, in the once bleak landscape of my future, was opportunity. I chose 
Indiana University, Bloomington, which most non-music people don't know, at least back then, ranked as the best music school in the world. It was often vying between one and three with uh, Eastman and Curtis. Um, and uh, although its name certainly and its mystique carries exponentially more weight, the Juilliard School, where I did my masters, um, was only a top 10 school. One that, like Yale and the Royal Academy, IU consistently outranked. But I didn't just choose it for its ranking. I chose it because it was a large, diverse state school that would allow me to transfer into any program once I figured out what the hell I really was going to do. But I didn't take being on scholarship for granted. I was immensely proud. I was one of the few vocalists on scholarship, let alone an undergrad. And I took it seriously. And I had a two-year stint at IU to fulfill in the music school before I could make any move. And it was to be rigorous. I had to maintain a 3.8 GPA uh, over a, a, a program that was going to average about 22 hours a semester for the first four semesters. Uh, but I was game. I was committed. I wanted to succeed. And even more so, I didn't want to disappoint my parents, who for the first time could tie me to something, anchor me to something stable and promising, and in truth, for the first time really in my life, were proud of me. My parents wept and waved as they drove the car out of my dormitory parking lot. I waved back and wiped my face, listening and observing the many goodbyes happening around me. I attempted to contemplate the journey I was about to embark on. I was curious, excited, naive, and something else, something new. There, standing alone in the parking lot, a warm breeze in my face, the echoes of many goodbyes happening around me, was what, where I met for the first time what would become my partner, my best friend for the next 10 years of my life. And his name was Anxiety. Anxiety is strong. Anxiety is powerful. He has a close cousin named Fear, and I thought they were very similar, but once I got to know them, I realized they're very different. Fear is not around much. He's there and gone in an instant. And in moments of panic, fear would ask me if I was gonna stay and fight or run and hide. But by the time I could answer him, he was gone, poof, in an instant. Fear is fleeting. Anxiety, on the other hand, lingers. Anxiety overstays his welcome. He is obsessed with the future. He asks me questions I cannot answer about things I cannot control. He incessantly asks, what if? When I first met anxiety, my default reaction was to ignore him, to lock, to lock him away, which I quickly learned that for me, and likely for you, I could not do. I can't deny the existence of anxiety. So instead of denying him, I engaged him. I personified him. I gave him a seat at the table. Later in life, I likened that personification to Dexter on Showtime. Do you guys know Showtime's Dexter? Dexter's dark passenger? Anxiety was my dark passenger, with one notable exception. Unlike Dexter's dark passenger, mine didn't make me kill people. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> All this time to turn. Little did I know, standing in the parking lot that day, that the journey I was about to be on was not really about singing. It was about my relationship with him, anxiety. First learning to accept and acknowledge, which I had done, then learning to engage, even embrace, and ultimately redefine what anxiety was for me. Like anything worth pursuing, learning to sing and become a professional, what I call getting to good, very much follows the hierarchy of competence. In the beginning, I was unconsciously incompetent. I was an idiot. I didn't know what I didn't know. I was naive. I knew I was good, and by all accounts, one of the best young singers in the country, 
But I didn't even think about singing. Literally, like in the act of singing, I wasn't thinking about singing. The stakes were too low. Anxiety wasn't around. Ignorance, apathy, indifference, those are not fertile fields for anxiety. He doesn't care. When I got to IU, it was like getting hit over the head with a hammer. Everyone was good. And everybody was one of the best young singers in the country. By October, I had a team around me. Voice teachers, music coaches, diction coaches, movement coaches, acting coaches, stage directors, conductors, and all of them, their job was to judge me, to assess my weakness, areas for improvement, things I needed to learn, answers to questions. Not only to have a chance of being a pro, but just to learn how to sing. A list was made, the punch list. I called it the suck list. The list of shit I sucked at. <laughs> it was endless. Seemingly insurmountable. Now, painfully aware of my incompetence, I had entered level two conscious incompetence. Anxiety loves level two. He loves conscious incompetence. It is his happy place. His minions like doubt and laziness eat away at my soul now, eat away at my desire. Coincidentally and not surprisingly, level two is when most people quit new pursuits. What once was easy and fun is now work. It's hard, it's difficult. And instead of hugs and pats on the back at the end of the performance, now the team has notes. And the notes are a little bit about what I did right but they're mostly about what I was still doing wrong. I would come home after a long day of searching and exploring and failing and sucking. Anxiety would sit in the darkness of my dorm room. I always pictured anxiety as slightly overweight, eating potato chips, playing video games in his boxers. <laughs> he always had a barbecue sauce stain on an undershirt that was three sizes too small. You sucked, he would say. You sucked today, you sucked yesterday, and you're gonna suck tomorrow. If you were good, you wouldn't suck. Pavarotti didn't suck, Pavarotti was good. You're gonna suck for the next four years, you're never gonna learn to sing, and all you're gonna have is a music degree. Good luck. Shut up, I would say. I would run to my bookcase and grab my copy of Great Singers on Great Singing, frantically thumbing to the chapter on Pavarotti. Did he suck? 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 He sucked! He sucked! Pavarotti sucked! So did Bergonzi, so did Corelli, so did Gedda. They all sucked at one point in time because what we're trying to do is fucking hard. One by one, my classmates would transfer. My voice studio became noticeably smaller, lecture halls vacant, but I remained. Anxiety and I remained. I had learned three lessons, not just on my craft, but on me, on life, acceptance. Number one, I knew I didn't have the answers, and I knew I may never have them. And regardless of how much I wanted it or searched, I may never be good. And anxiety's prophecies about my future may indeed come true. Persistence, but just because I accepted that didn't mean I had to quit. I needed to commit. It was through that commitment was the only way, the only chance I was gonna have to getting too good. And in that persistence, that undying, unfailing persistence, the screams from anxiety for me to quit turned into whispers and slowly went away. Resilience. I had to become resilient, thick-skinned. It was during conscious incompetence, painfully aware of my suck, that I still had to perform every day in public, knowing that the performance itself was an experiment that was likely to fail. I would use the performance to try this or that or something that worked in a lesson with my teacher or something I discovered last night in the practice room. Knowing that in that performance and the failure thereof, I was opening myself to judgment and criticism. I had to become resilient. I learned to 
shed preciousness, to shed presumption and expectation. I learned to separate myself from my craft and put craft over there where I could view him from a distance, the voice, the instrument, objectively. And in doing that, the screaming anxiety and sharp criticism turned its focus from me to him. And objectively, I could now see that although we had crossed shit off the sub list, that things would break in the background. <laughs> I knew, although we still had a long way to go, anxiety and I were getting close. We were together for good and for bad. I made my debut at 22, at a time at least 18, 19 years ago when most singers were hoping to make a debut in their late 20s or early 30s. I did it the year I graduated college. I was lucky, I was dumb, I was good. And I was asked to sing Alfredo in Verdi's La Traviata, opening the season for Indianapolis Opera. Now, consciously competent, I had a set of routines, processes, techniques, tricks, ways of doing that I desperately wanted to try out. I wanted to see if I could deliver under pressure. Anxiety was still there right next to me. And he was quick to remind me that I was only a year earlier totally incompetent, slowly ticking off items on the suck list, each one a war won. He was quick to remind me how quickly I could become incompetent again, but his tone had changed now. He was much more of a minder. He made sure that I did the things I knew I needed to do, the things that consciously made me competent. Anxiety walked with me on opening night from my dressing room to the stage. He stood next to me backstage as I paced, going through my act one plan, my routine, where I'd be, when, where, how I'd sing this, that phrase, when I would breathe, when I would shake out, make sure I didn't have a tense neck, every single thing lined out so that hopefully when I got on stage, I could be aware and be in the moment. Suddenly, it was time. Don't suck. Be present. He whispered. He winked and pushed me into the lights. There, on stage, was a force, a power, unlike anything I had felt before. It was electric, as though electricity was surging through the audience, through the orchestra, through me, and like a boomerang back out into the house. I hadn't even opened my mouth yet, and I was addicted. I needed it. I looked into the wings, and anxiety was gone, and I was ready. I sang act one, timid. When I opened my mouth, I realized the house had become very dry. And I don't mean um, physically, I mean aurally. During dress rehearsals, there was no audience, so the house was very wet, meaning we got a lot of sound back, and singers love that. I hadn't learned not to listen yet. But now, with 2,100 folks in the audience soaking up the sound, there was nothing. So, consciously competent, I made the decision I would chill and kind of cruise through Act 1, making sure that I had enough chops left for my big singing in Act 2 and 3. I was proud of myself for making a game time decision, consciously competent, but the result was eh. Wasn't bad, wasn't good, but certainly wasn't the first impression I wanted to make. I was pretty sure anxiety was going to set in, but still, he was gone. I knew in Act Two, which I opened with my aria, and the way it was staged, there was a hot spot. Every opera house has a hot spot or a few. It's where acoustically the sound just bounces around and smacks you in the face. You guys know that feeling. It's like singing in the shower. Singers love it. So when the time came, I hit my spot and luxuriated in my own sound. 
I sang my cadenza, few scales, high note, a cappella, no orchestra, just me and my sound, oh, in the audience. When I hit the final note and the orchestra came in, I was a full step sharp, almost an entire minor third, totally out of tune. The audience was gracious. Their applause slightly warmer than tepid. I trounced down to my dressing room, preparing myself for the lashing I was about to receive from anxiety. When I got there, he was seated, his legs up on my dressing table, eating my apple, reading my magazine. That sucked. You should take a note of that. What? That sucked, you should take a note of that. You were out of tune. Take a note so you don't do it again. Okay. I started my costume change, waiting for him to really set in. You suck, you're gonna sing the rest of the show out of tune. All of those people who said you were fucking crazy for uh, debuting so early or licking their chops, they're gonna eat you alive. But it never came. He just sat there, eating my apples. I got the call for my next entrance. And as I was leaving, he said, hey, don't suck, sing in tune, and close the door. And I did. And I walked upstairs and sang the rest of the show beautifully, arguably impeccably. The audience was warm in my curtain call. And by the end of the run, they had asked me back for the next year I got a generous review from the critic, one I didn't think I deserved. And within a month, I had signed with management. And within three months, I had bookings three years in advance. In my conscious competence, with glimpses of unconscious competence, which is nirvana, I had learned three more lessons on craft. Technique, technique, Technique. When I first started singing, I thought there was a way to sing. Total bullshit. There are many ways to sing, and a professional needs them all. You have to solve every problem with every tool available to you. The difference between an amateur and a professional is consistency. My voice being, my, my body being my instrument, I had to deliver consistent performances, regardless if I was sick or tired or weak or scared. I had to have a wide tool set to deliver regardless of what I was feeling. And drawing upon that tool set, oftentimes in the moment, based on how that note was feeling or the previous phrase was going, became exhilarating. It was a puzzle. I would play games. If I was sick, I couldn't wait to get on stage to see if I could fool the audience into thinking I was well. With technique, anxiety didn't hang around that much. Because when he would ask me what I would do if I had an answer, Process. I learned that by focusing on process, that process became the main event, and the performance itself was just a result. <coughs> process, the way we do routine. Technique. Practice. Rehearsal. All of that. A great process, ultimately, I learned, made a great performance a foregone conclusion. And by focusing on process, the stakes were lower. Suddenly, regardless of how prestigious the house was or how famous the conductor, or if there was a tough critic in the audience, by focusing on process, I was just doing the same shit I always did. Same song, different house. And in those lower stakes, anxiety was quiet. Focus. This one I still carry with me today. I learned to focus only and always on the things I control. Anxiety loves everything out there. What they think about you. What they're saying about you behind your back. What signals they're sending you with their body language. It's a good tactic. Because in distracting me with all of that shit, I couldn't focus on this. And this is ultimately what gets you to good. And by focusing only and always on the things I control, I could then engage with anxiety and have a conversation. What if they hate you, he would say. Well, I can't control if they hate me. 
I can only go sing. What if they don't ask you back next year? I, I can't control if they ask me back. Besides, if they don't ask me back, it may be because they don't have anything for me. Or they may hate me. Either way, I have to go sing. What if the orchestra plays the wrong note and you miss your entrance? I'm not even listening to the orchestra. I know my note. Are we done? Our relationship had changed. Deep down, I wondered if there was a place for him in my life anymore. For whatever reason I made my debut so young, I am eternally thankful. It allowed me to live most of my 20s satisfying my ego. Actually living life as a performer rather than spending those years wondering what it would be like. And because I was so young, when ultimately I chose to leave singing, I was still young, still capable, still able of pursuing what I truly was meant to do, which is what I do today. And still to this day, I practice all of this. It is a part of me, in my soul. Now it's not necessarily aimed at, at keeping anxiety at arm's length. It's just me. And when I get to work with my team or they're struggling, the advice I can give them is advice that was born in a practice room in Indiana over 20 years ago. Learn by doing. You know, in light of the performance anxiety, whatever the setting, it doesn't need to be something like this or certainly not an opera stage. It could be as something as simple as speaking up in a conference, on a conference call. That's scary sometimes. Right? The only way you learn to do it is by doing it. There's never going to be a time. There's never going to be a time when anxiety is like, hey, go crush. It doesn't happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You just have to do. My team, most of them up there, know I am notorious for trial by fire. I believe in that. Learn by doing. Accept failure. Anxiety doesn't like failure because he knows once you find out, it's not that bad. My first voice teacher will always remember this. In the throes of anxiety one day, he said, Nick, fuck it, go sing, no babies will die. <laughs> I did, and I failed. And no babies died, thankfully. <laughs> Accepting failure puts everything in perspective. And anxiety does not like perspective. He wants you tense, worried all the time. Have a team. Certainly, in my experience, um, through my training, I had a team, a giant team. I didn't ask for them. I just had them. I'm a big believer in building a team around you that tells you the truth. And be on a team, and be gracious and kind, but tell the truth. Show your work, certainly for designers, don't hoard your work. Show it. Show it to your team who you trust who's going to tell you the truth. You may fail. That's okay. And then even more specifically, test your work. For us, certainly, not to talk about Spire, but that's huge. I can't imagine, again, I didn't have a design pedigree when I was an interaction designer. I was making that shit up. But I tested. I tested. So I could combine my intuition with data or evidence. And that removed the know it when I see it, that we all dread, that anxiety loves. Accept what you know, accept what you don't know, know what you do, and fly the flag of your knowledge proudly. Be confident. Uh, there's a, this is gonna, there's a uh, interesting, uh, when I went through this with my wife yesterday, she said, this is specifically important for women. There's something scary to certain folks about a woman who knows. Fly that flag, ladies. <laughs> Focus on your process and ignore the noise, the way you do. Like I said, great process will lead to great results. And in today's business environment, within the walls of every office, there is so much noise. Whether it's interpersonal or office politics, it's absurd. 80% of the time, people are only focused on noise. And it's no wonder they're anxious all the time. Focus on the process, and the results will come.
Separate yourself from the craft. This is another one big for designers is don't be married to your work. You are a conduit. You are a problem solver. You're not an artist. And that's okay. It's okay. Don't get married to your work. If someone hates your work, your immediate response would be like, oh, I got 900 other options. And grow your technique. Think. Without this, we get into a rut. We keep doing the same thing all the time. And certainly in tech, but I would argue in every field, the problems are changing all the time. You need techniques to solve new problems. It also keeps you fresh. And when you have technique, anxiety isn't around that much because you have the solution. And lastly, I don't think people know this. I mean, probably you do, but like the amount of preparation, even in a single opera production or in any performance is endless. And preparing is not just thinking, it is doing. It's getting things into your body, into your, your, the very core. So that, again, in that preparation, that process of preparation, the performance just becomes a result. Anxiety still visits me. Although these days he's much more like an old friend. Never screaming, never menacing. Much more just keeping me honest and focused and learning and persistent and resilient. But there is a part of me that misses our days together. They make me who I am. His energy, that pressure, the successes, those failures, each one of them paramount, each one of them precious and perfect. And I experienced it all with my friend my partner, my dark passenger, anxiety. Thank you so much.